So welcome everyone um, to Flycatchers in Missouri, uh, hosted by the Missouri Birding Society and the Missouri Young Birders Club, and also the Missouri River Bird Observatory. So lots of great groups bringing you this presentation tonight. I just, my name is Paige Wittick, and I am the education coordinator for the Missouri River Bird Observatory and the state coordinator for the Missouri Young Birders Club. And I just want to go over a few um, tech things for tonight. So we have a chat button. If you tap your screen or move it at all or move your mouse at all, a bar will come up and there'll be a should be a chat window and a QA. and a um, If you have any questions during the presentation, we're going to ask that you put them into the Q&A section um, to make it easier for us to find your questions so we can make sure to answer it. And if you have any comments or technical issues, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over. Oh, last thing though, we will be recording the webinar. So if you want to view it later, you will be able to do so on the Missouri River Bird Observatory YouTube channel page, as well as the Missouri Birding Society website. Um, and we'll have that up hopefully by the end of the week. So I'm going to turn it over to Edge Wade, uh, the president of the Missouri Birding Society to introduce our wonderful speaker for tonight. Good evening. Good evening and welcome everybody. I met Tim Barksdale in the fall of 1993. I was a student and he was the instructor in an adult education beginning birding class and his enthusiasm helped flame my birding spark. I didn't know it at the time, but two years before that, I had set the record for the most birds seen in Missouri in a single year, a record that stood for more than a quarter century. And more remarkable is that he did it with no internet and without the mobile phones that we now depend on for updates for bird sightings. The last bird he saw that year was a Ross's gull. It was also the first state record of a Ross's gull. And he saw it at Lincoln Shields at Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. And he was there that December 31st, not by accident, but because his knowledge of occurrence of birds in Missouri led him to believe that that site just might be the best place for him to find just one more bird for that year. And he did. Tim the birder is also a superb bird videographer. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has purchased his library of footage of videos of birds from nearly every country in the Western Hemisphere. Tim knows his birds and he knows Missouri. He's currently using that knowledge as he pursues yet one more birding big year, his personal challenge. And at the same time, working to complete an MBS, uh, MBS, PBS publication, The Wild Story of Conservation in Missouri. He's become increasingly concerned with conservation and birding ethics as he adds to his Missouri life list, now at 396 with his recent sighting of the purple gallinule at Mingo. Tim has taken time from his big year birding and filming to prepare this workshop on flycatchers of Missouri to share his knowledge and his enthusiasm with you. So heads up folks, he's got a lot of tips that he's sharing. Tim, you're on. Thank you, Edge. So let me queue up my screen here. We're gonna do a share screen and we're going to hopefully have this very simple for you. You should be able to see that now, correct? Good. And um, thank you, Edge and Paige. Um, so there are 44 species of flycatchers in the ABA area. And of those, 18 are found 
in Missouri, but that's not all the flycatchers. And so on the left in this main screen over here, you should see- Hi, the Tim. I don't want to interrupt you, but it looks like you still need to press play, I think, for, we're just seeing oh. your notes and everything still. Thank too, you. So. Thank you. Yeah, Let's of course. Back. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. How's that? That's much better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So the contopus are uh, the main plate over here on the left. And you start with really only three species that we have to worry about, the olive-sided, the western wood peewee, and the eastern wood peewee. But I'm putting these up to show you what you are really um, up against, because these birds are absolutely incredible in similarity. And the flycatchers are one of the most difficult groups of any of the groups. So now we're on the Empidnax on this side. Again, most of our birds here are on the top, but look at the diversity and the similarity. Over here, you have Philoscopus uh, elanias, and then you have uh, down into some of the other more obscure species. My notes are not showing, so um, we're gonna just keep going with this stuff. Uh, and then we move into the Myarchus. There are two plates of Myarchus here, and the, the top four Myarchus are the ones that we really have to worry about here. This is the ash throated 385, which would be a first state record for Missouri. Then this is a brown crested down here. And this is the one that is, we're very familiar with, the uh, great crested. So then the other Marcus are on the right side, upper right. And then you get into the pygmy tyrants and other, again, obscure species. So now we're getting to a useful page the kingbirds, the tyrannus, the genus tyrannus, and uh, you start off with tropical kingbird here, 387. Um, this would be the tropical uh, couches kingbird. And then we move down to cassins, thick build, western and eastern. Gray kingbird is 383, 363 over here. We have the uh, wonderful scissor tail flycatcher. We don't need to worry about loggerhead kingbird. And down below, there's one record of fork-tailed flycatcher. So we can basically deal with that when we get to it. So in Missouri, we have, again, the one family, there are six genuses and there are 18 species. And these three little guys on the left are the quiz birds coming up at the end. So you're gonna have a chance to tell me what you think they are or tell the host and text them in. You will not see these again for a while, but you're going to learn and we're going to teach you why they are what they are. So pyrocephalus is pretty obvious. Pyrocephalus is the vermilion flycatcher, the flame-headed perhaps, you would call that in the Latin. Sayornis is the Phoebes. Myarchus is the large and reddish-winged flycatchers. Of, again, we only have one species officially recorded. That's great crested. The Tyrannus is a very common genus that we have from Eastern Kingbird on through the Gray Kingbird. Contopus would be the three that we mentioned before, olive-sided Western Wood Pea we and Eastern Wood Pea, of which only two are common. And then we have the Impidinex. And that's the one that we're really here to talk about tonight. So this used to be the common thought of um, how difficult Impidinex flycatchers were. This was in the 1950 bird banding manual. And these two birds, again, you are going to learn hopefully what they are by the end. And there will be a quiz. You will be able to see their picture again. They will be identified in the next picture. So this bird on the right is different from this bird on the left. And you have a chance to um, take a look at them now and make some quick notes in your brain. And then we'll move on. So the Missouri species, again, olive-sided, western wood peewee, eastern wood peewee, yellow-bellied flycatcher, Acadian, alder, willow, and least flycatchers. Those are all the ones that we're really going to uh, focus in in uh, majority, but we're going to go through every one of them. And the, the smaller print birds are coming up next. So this is an olive-sided on the left. I want you to note the vest, the large vest on the, on the flanks, the massive bill, the crest, the short fork tail, 
And uh, this is a very distinctive uh, species that is actually still migrating through the state right now. Here's another little quiz for you. These are both Impidnax flycatchers. I brought them up here again fairly early. Before I give you too much, uh, I want you to take a look at the left bird, the eye ring, the bill, the uh, both the wing bars, the streaks on the, on the coverts. I want you to look down here at what this is called the primary extension. I want you to look at the tail relative to the body length and relative to the extension of these primaries. How does this shape and how does this look as the size of the bird overall? Same thing is true with this bird, correct? This bird has a larger bill. It's yellower. It's got a different shaped eye ring. It's got a little bit of yellowish on the wing bars, yellowish overall on the body, much more greenish in color, fairly long tail, and a fairly prominent and long primary projection. So those are your hints about what these species are. So the next question is how many species are on this page? Because you can see the similarities between these birds. You can see some of the differences between these birds. And so we're gonna start talking now about some of the specifics of the flycatchers. So great crested is our most common forest bird that's very large, very noisy, and relatively easy to find, quote unquote, right? Um, you can hear them. And so one of the assignments that you have, and I'm issuing that right now, is for each one of you um, sometime this next week to please go online, look up the calls of every one of these 18 species. You can go to Xenocanto, you can go to All About Birds, the Cornell website, or you can look it up in any other way on YouTube or things like that. But some of the things that people have said about these birds have been really quite in, in uh, in error. And one of the things that is, is mostly in error about them is that people have said they're not very social. And yet, when I've been filming in South America, I've witnessed flocks of hundreds of fork-tailed flycatchers, hundreds of scissor-tailed flycatchers, and hundreds of eastern kingbirds going into roosts in, the, in these swamps overnight. And this is also true in Trinidad. Um, so, the other thing is that they say the voices are not very highly evolved. And I disagree with that statement because I think the voices have proved to be that one of the things which are most important in identifying these birds. And each one of you should take a little bit of time to really learn some of these bird calls. I think they'll be very helpful to you. Great Crested is about the size of a robin or an Eastern, a little bit, maybe a little bit the same size as an Eastern Kingbird. And um, these are relatively easy to find, I think, again. The bright yellow belly, the gray throat overall with a little bit of whitish in some areas, the crested look on the head, large bill, um, minimal eye ring, but bright red in the wing coverts and on the tail in particular. You're gonna see that in this photograph now. Um, you can see the reddish in the wings here on the wing stripes. Those are on the outer, the inner webs, so you don't see them as well. Um, and then the tail is very prominent, um, the uh, orangey red rust. And so this is the classic Myarchus structure. And a Myarchus, you need to learn the genuses and think of these birds in terms of the genuses because the genuses are gonna give you really simple groupings in which to work with. And that's gonna be very helpful for you in the long term in learning these different groups. So we'll go through a couple of the easy ones now. Scissor tail flycatcher is um, one of the most beautiful birds, I think, anywhere in the world. I love to watch them. I love to listen to them. Um, they, again, are fairly uh, simple in the prairie country in particular. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, they started moving into the boot heel. Uh, they are now up into Mocaine and Jeff City area in the bottoms, and uh, as far north as Sedalia, Kansas City, on a regular basis. You can find them breeding over in that part of the state. Fork-tail flycatcher is a different cat. I mean, it is a uh, accidental species, very diagnostic. This is the Monarchus subspecies. So with the gray back, the uh, savanna, savanna species has, subspecies has a blackish back. Both of them have the long tail, just like a scissor tail, and they are stunning birds. Uh, there's one record to my knowledge from Missouri up near, um, I think Terry McNeely and 
Steve Kinder had some hand in finding that bird. And uh, what a neat bird to find here in Missouri. So now we're coming again to one of the simpler quote unquote birds to identify. Simple maybe because they arrive very early and they are a fairly common nester. So you get some time with this bird. This is an Eastern Phoebe. Uh, it is in the genus Saornis. The tail is fairly long. You will also notice that they have this constant flicking motion to their tail. They love to bob their tail and wag it. And this is a very diagnostic feature of the behavior which helps you identify this bird. There's no eye ring. The bill is mostly completely dark except for the juvenile birds. And down here on the belly, there's a variable amount of yellowish. It can extend up into the center of the belly particularly and along the flanks. The song is a simple, simple Phoebe, Phoebe and Phoebe. And they like caves and cliffs and front porches and all kinds of cool places, barns to build their nest in. So all these factors make this a fairly neat species to begin your studies of flycatchers with. And here's some more examples of, of Eastern Phoebes. Um, again, showing some various plumage colors, some browns and grays, some of the nest building behavior and some of the just uh, standard perching. They often will hold their wings down below the tail plane and they'll bob the tail again while their wings are held at their side a little bit. That's not necessarily always the case, but that's a regular thing that we see them doing. And again, no eye ring, the call, and they make a, an annotated chip. They're very animated birds. They're very alert of people, and they're yet not afraid. They're kind of accustomed and really enjoy being uh, close to people. We seem to be able to give them a little bit of protection that they need. Say's Phoebe is rare in Missouri, but it is increasing in numbers. Uh, why exactly, I'm not sure, but this bird has a completely black tail. It has this rusty ochreous color through the chest um, and then down on the under tail coverts. Again, a dark cap, brownish mostly, a little bit blackish, no eye ring, and the distinctly shaped wings in flight are constricted at the base where they fly and gives it a kind of a rackety shape as they fly. They fly with a really distinctive rhythm and it's a it's a distinctive way it's how I found the bird that you're about to see on the left here this is the sage phoebe that we found at the Jeff City uh, Christmas bird count and then down below on the right is another uh, beautiful adult uh, sage phoebe with the lovely orangey rusty colored belly uh, overall brownish and paler above and then above uh, that's not a sage phoebe is it that's a secret uh, female vermilion flycatcher. So as you're looking at these birds, you, you do have to be aware of some of these things that look very similar to uh, some of the more common species that we're expecting, more or less. Say's Phoebe would be your first automatic thing to think about if you see an orange-bellied bird like that, but vermilion flycatcher is also a possibility. Let's go on to another fairly common Tyrannus, and that would be a Western Kingbird. Western Kingbird has a medium bill. There's no real eye ring. There's no real mask, although there's a dark spot between the eyes and the bill. This is called the lores. The throat is whitish to gray, and the tail has a very thin, but very clear marking of white on that outer edge. And so the outer tail feathers are very clearly marked. The um, other thing about this bird is that it has a back coloration that's normally grayish, but it can be greenish in some lights and in some plumages. And that may be more of the immatures, maybe not. Sometimes the angles can do it all for you. So the key marks again on Western Kingbird are the bright yellow belly, almost all the way up to the grayish chest, the whiter throat, the moderately sized but blackish bill, and then no big mask. So, I mean, there's a little bit of a hint on this photograph of a uh, patch behind the eye, but that's really not always seen. So um, be careful with that because this bird, the tropical kingbird, which has a much larger bill, and we have at least one record of this bird again too, um, is very similarly looking to the Western kingbird. But the most distinctive thing is that the head is flatter and the bill is much, much larger, much more prominent. Tail is longer, 
The tail does have some whitish edging, but it's completely different and not as prominent as Western Kingbird. Again, the head and the throat and the upper breast form a combination of this whiter color bleeding into this lighter colored chest, but again, an equally yellow belly. And I think the tail uh, proportion is distinctly longer uh, on tropical kingbird. These are mostly tropical kingbirds again. Um, this bird here on the left again, the fairly moderately colored chest, a paler head, uh, this really nice throat, but look at the size of the bill. This is the most distinctive thing. And then the shaping of the tail, the length of the tail is very prominent. Um, this bird on the upper right has a much paler, whiter throat. And it is, um, again, characterized by that huge bill. The bill is just enormous. So I snuck another one in on you below on the right. This is the Cassin's Kingbird. And you can see the distinctly dark gray chest on this bird and the very tightly restricted uh, chin patch of the white on the below this very sharply demarcated uh, patch on the eye. And the bill again is a large bill, not as large as tropical kingbird, but very distinctly hooked. And this is one of the key things about Cassin's kingbird. Overall from the, the breast above, it's very, very dark gray with that very sharp white cheek uh, patch that's just below the bill and does not go into the full throat. So this bird is a really unique species that um, is uh, one to be looking for in Missouri. This is a highly uh, likely bird to uh, show up sometime. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see one this year for several reasons. We'll talk a little bit about the drought factors um, that are going on right now in the West, um, maybe towards the end. Eastern kingbird is the classic kingbird. I think everybody east of the, the 100th meridian uh, probably has a good chance to see this bird. It is really distinctive, uh, a fairly good sized bill again, a little bit larger than Western kingbird normally, but not as large as a tropical or, or one of the next species that we're gonna look at. The tip of the tail is very broadly tipped with white, can be ragged though at times, sometimes it seems a little bit narrower, but the tip of the tail is really the classic thing on, on this species. Um, but black and white really is the whole bird. These things are black on dorsally and on the top and the pale white below, and it's just a really simple identification. So here's some more birds, again with the bullet points marking the identification factors. Both of these shots show the hidden uh, red crown, which can be displayed very actively when they're being aggressive toward like a crow. Uh, if a crow or a blue jay, something that may be predating their nest or is a potential nest predator comes in their area, they're very aggressive. They, they will ride that bird and pull feathers out. They will attack red-tailed hawks or anything that comes near their nesting territory. And that's often a chance for us to see that concealed reddish crown. Um, so again, no real mass because the bird is overall black and the bird bill is large, uh, but not, uh, not a real huge honker. And I want to distinctly point that out because this bird is the one that we could potentially be confused with. This bird, again, like other Florida birds right now, um, seem to be on the move. For what reason, I have no idea, but there are several really important things about this bird that we can note and distinguish from the Eastern Kingbird. And this is gray Kingbird with a much more prominent bill, much more bulky on from dorse, uh, top to bottom, as well as long, it's very prominent. The mask is very clearly marked on uh, the head. So you've got a white eye line, but that white continues all the way back into the nape, comes around to the throat, and it forms a very overall lightish area that goes straight on down into the chest and breast and abdomen, all the way to the undertail coverts. The, sh the tail is relatively short, uh, which is distinctively different in the profile than Eastern Kingbird. And so um, we have another little set of these to look at, or another individual. And again, emphasizing how big this bill is. This is a huge bill. And so you can distinctly get an immediate impression that something's wrong. If you're looking at that and going like, 
that Eastern Kingbird doesn't look quite right, uh, but you don't know what it is. You're not automatically thinking for, you know, gray Kingbird. You can look at that bill and go, okay, I need to get a picture of this, or I need to record this somehow, uh, because that bill is massive. And uh, again, the mask, you can see the shaping of this facial area here, a little bit of grayish bleeding out from the nape, and then white all the way down to the undertail coverts. And again, a fairly short tail. Uh, when you look at how long the extensions of the primary are, that's part of the why this is appearing this way though. Look how long these primaries come almost all the way down to the tip of the undertail coverts. Still, it's a short tailed appearance. Okay, I don't know if this is easy or not, but um, if you see them in the field, it's certainly an easy identification. And these birds uh, didn't show up in the state of Missouri for several decades. And we've had since the 90s, um, about seven or eight records, individual records of these uh, wonderful and beautiful birds. Vermilion flycatchers are stunning. Uh, one showed up at um, uh, in Kansas City area and recently, and that was uh, the one that was my first one. 1967, as a 15 year old birder, I missed the ones at Bush Wildlife Area. And, uh, and so I, I've always had a special place for this bird. And that was a really cool moment to get over there to get that, that individual male. Now we're gonna move into again to some of our um, normal quote unquote birds. This is olive sided flycatcher. I wanna point out how, again, a very short tailed appearance. This is a wonderful example of the breast as, as this one, this, this dark vest that is on the side of the bird. Then this flank view here shows the relative thinness of the bill, but a very big headed with a crest again. And this white tuft at the back uh, is really unique. This is a highly migratory flycatcher. I filmed them in Costa Rica, as well as up in uh, oh, Manitoba and Quebec and other, other provinces, Montana and Alberta and Alaska. Um, they're an incredible, powerful bird. And I think just because of that alone, the fact that they move so much is one of the reasons they're one of my favorites. But their call is the quick three beers. And then they do a kick, quick, 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 quick. They do chattery calls and they do single noted chips too as well. So let's go over the field marks again. Dark head, the white throat with this paler uh, central area flanked by a vest, a darker vest, and then the white tuft with a fairly short notched tail, olive sided flycatcher. And then also in the contopus, we are going into now one of our common species that we have uh, you can go outside and find them in a forested area today, probably. This is the Eastern Wood Peewee. Eastern Wood Peewee has a little bit of a yellower bill, much finer in size and shape. Um, the upper bill is dark and there are varying amounts of dark on the underside of that bill, but the throat is white. And then this amount of white that is on uh, the belly and abdomen varies. You can see on each of these three shots that there's a variable amount of whitish on the chest and belly. This is a lot like some of the birds that we have uh, down in the pine lands. I filmed, I photographed this one down in the uh, brownhead nuthatch area. So that's an actual uh, fairly dark chested and vested almost um, Eastern wood peewee, uh, but it sits there and it'll go So learn that call and you'll have the key to find Eastern wood peewees. They're calling on territory and around young and they're very common through the summer here. No real eye ring, fairly, um, they're not really strong, strong wing bars. They're fairly prominent, but this upper one in particular is often faded. So they sometimes seem like it's a single wing bar. The amount of white that's on the secondary section down here is variable. Um, the primary projection, so from this area right here, these are the secondaries. And below this area, this extension is called the primary extension. And it's based upon the fact that if, if these were the secondaries and these were the primaries, sticking how far those primaries project past the secondaries is called that extension. 
And so you're going to notice on this, particularly this next group, how long those primaries extend beyond the secondaries. This is going to become a very key point that we're going to be looking at on all the next couple of species. We still have some more peewees to look at in a minute. And Eastern wood peewee is, again, this, this shot shows this nice crested look. Sometimes it can be very round headed, but not much of an eye ring. If anything, they're going to look more like a Phoebe, but they have wing bars. And so this is one of the things that you're going to, by learning the call, this soft, you're going to learn how to identify this bird very simply. This is the Western wood peewee. It's only occurred once to my knowledge in the state on a absolute verified basis, and that is because of the call. Western wood peewees give a very burry call. Their call is kind of almost the same, but it's very, very vibratory. And I'm not going to make a fool of myself trying to do that one again. But the, even the call notes is it's just sitting in the tree and giving its happy call because it just ate a bunch of birds, uh, bugs, sorry. <laughs> that bird is um, going to have to call to be verified in Missouri. It's just not going to get accepted by most people. You are going to be able to see, though, that there are, is a darker overall vest. It's a darker and more uniform vest. This primary extension is, ex is much longer, and you can see it on this bird as well as this bird, how long these primaries go beyond the secondaries. And this increases this short-tailed look, I think. I think this really uh, shows up nicely as a shorter tailed, but really it's particularly this, when you get beyond the under tail covers, the upper tail covers, it seems like a short tail, but that is also because these primaries are so long, they go so long. So again, just a tiny little eye ring showing on any of these birds. These birds all show a tiny one behind, mostly behind the eye. Uh, again, a nice wider throat, but really restricted. It's not a big wider throat like the Eastern wood pea was. And so um, this is a tough one that um, we have to keep an eye out for because they're probably coming through more regularly than we're, we're recording. And now we're moving into the tough guys. But we've learned some of these basics by looking at some of these other species. And these are now moving into the Impidnex flycatchers. This is probably one of the uh, more common ones during parts of the migration. This is the least flycatcher, and we're going to go over this in detail. So first of all, the bill is bicolored, and it is not clearly marked um, with yellow below and all yellow below, nor uh, is it a, a very clear even all above as a totally dark bill. That margin of the mandible can be marked yellowish as well. And you'll see that all these birds, except for this one down here, uh, display this. The eye ring is pretty prominent. It's not a huge eye ring, but it's a moderate eye ring, a little bit larger behind the eye on most of these birds, but not always, that's not consistent. I picked this bird because you can see excuse me, how gray the head is, how brownish the back is. And again, looking at these other two birds over on the right, how that can change even from one angle. I want you to look at the wing bars now. This upper wing bar is quite um, prominent. The lower wing bar is very bold. And then the whitish on the wings uh, on the secondaries, the edging is pretty prominent as well. There's a variable amount of yellowish. Some uh, least flycatchers will show more than others. Some can really look fairly yellow down below here, uh, but uh, it's never a very strong, bright greenish yellow. It's always kind of this paler, more of a lemony pale yellow. So let's look at the primary projection now, because this is a really important mark that we're going to look at in each of the next uh, five, or each of the five birds we get in Missouri. And this is a short to medium projection. It's not very long. And yet this bird is small enough that in each of these shots, except for this one probably, you're gonna look at that bird and say it has a short tail. And I think that's one of the key things about least flycatcher is that it does seem to have a short tail. It's a small flycatcher, 
And if you hear it, you're going to hear this chebec, chebec, chebec. And they do this very sharp chebec, chebec, chebec. And they will do it in rhythmic and fairly rapid drilling chebec, 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 chebecs. So um, that's something to keep your ears open for and learn that call of least flycatcher for sure. Here's another page. These birds were all grayer. Um, and a little bit more greenish, but they still exhibit basically the same principles that we just looked at in the other birds. Very short or most moderate primary projection, very short-tailed look on each one of these birds, fairly big-headed uh, compared to the rest of the body. The bill is small though in every, every instance, and it is bicolored. Um, and again, the browns or the greens or the grays are the classic uh, look of this little little and small flycatcher, least flycatcher in Pednex minimus. Okay, so here's one of our um, completely different uh, and a nesting bird in Missouri. This is a, a, an Acadian flycatcher. And I want you to look at the bill size immediately on this bird because this bird is very different looking in the bill shape and size from what we just saw. Look at how in each of these individuals and the next three too, you're gonna to have a very large, very prominent bill. This one really shows the bill beautifully. It's a paler, it's not a consistently dark bill above or below. Sometimes the yellow bill below can be almost completely yellow. This is a very greenish flycatcher in most of these uh, shots, but at times in the forest, it can look very grayish as well. The eye ring is fairly prominent again, a little bit more behind, but consistently um, kind of a moderate, um, I would say a medium sized eye ring, not a huge eye ring, nowhere is it particularly um, uh, swollen in any particular direction. Uh, fairly moderately yellow below, can be quite yellowish and greenish at times with very prominent wing bars and very prominent markings on the wings, the secondaries. This is one of the classic things about this. And some birds almost seem to have a whitish fringe tail. Um, so the primary projection is pretty long on this bird, right? Look at this down here and look at the, how this shaping is. It certainly is much longer than the least flycatcher. And I want you to particularly note these, the distance in these two primaries right here. This is primary number eight and number seven, six, five, four, and then they go on up and disappear under the secondaries. But these primaries in particular, there's a big gap here. And this shows you how long this primary projection is. And so this is one of the things, if you find an Acadian flycatcher that is not calling, you can look at that primary projection and look at those, try to look at them anyway, and see what you think. It gives you a clue about what this silent bird might be. And again, don't forget that 95% of the flycatchers 45 years ago were unidentifiable in the hand. Now we're down to just the trails flycatcher complex, which is one of the next ones we're gonna look at after this species. So here are, again, a group of all Acadian flycatchers. And the bill is a little bit smaller on this individual. The bill is a little bit smaller on this individual, but look at the primary projection here on this huge primary projection. Again, a nice gap between seven and eight, very long tailed appearance. Similar up here, these birds are probably a little bit more uh, into their summer. This one looks like it's carrying food for young. So it's uh, probably got some feather wear by now. But again, this bird on the left, on the prominent branch, this is a Minnesota bird. These individuals have very strong, bold markings on the wings. And yet there's a very long primary projection here again with eight and seven being a really nice long gap between those two. You can see nine and 10 down here, just the edges of those. So these tail feathers and the way the primary projections work, you're still seeing a bird that for the most part, looks long-tailed, but almost always looks very long-billed. Again, fairly good eye ring too. Greenish to gray, but if you learn the call of this bird, the there's like a whole bunch of names now. Pizza, Selik, Shik, you know, there's all kinds of different ways of putting that, 
but this bird has a very distinctive call and is really um, important for you to learn this one in our Ozark forests. Uh, this one you can easily identify by call alone. Okay, so now we're moving into a different group again, and uh, these are uh, the toughest, in my opinion, of the flycatchers, the next two species. So the next uh, six pages we're going to look at, and this is an alder flycatcher. Alder flycatchers tend to be, I think, a little bit more brownie, um, brownie gray. They tend to look less gray, uh, greenish than any of the others. Uh, their head is uh, often a little bit bigger than the rest of the body, uh, proportionally, it seems like. Uh, it's almost like you have a little bit larger head stuck on a least flycatcher body in some ways. But the primary projection, this is a highly migratory species again. And so look at the fairly long primary projection, but it's slender. It's a fairly slender primary projection. Um, when, it's, when the wings are folded in particular, it seems sharper pointed and the wings are not as broad as a Cadian flycatcher. The tail looks long again, I think, on all the alders. Um, the eye ring is very small, relatively speaking, compared to several of the other flycatcher, uh, Impidnex flycatchers. Uh, it has one of those normally smaller eye rings and thinner eye rings. Uh, again, I think this bird looks fairly long tailed. If you put that least flycatcher shot next to it, the bill is longer. The eye ring is about the same. The throat sometimes is a little bit more prominent. I think the white of the throat can sometimes be a helpful uh, guide. The yellowish down in here can go up onto the chest. It can be a little more grayish at times though. Uh, these are really tough, really tough birds to identify. The call, however, is really easy and it's Phoebeo, Phoebeo. And they, they say they're calling migration, they're calling right now. There were birds noted in I think both Tower Grove Park and Forest Park just the last couple of days. So um, uh, this is something to be listening for. Let's go to the next page. And um, these are kind of the um, rule breakers here. So this is actually a willow flycatcher up on the right. Uh, and this one is, um, the pale southwestern species and the grayer of the birds, the grayest of all the uh, flycatchers. And here's a willow flycatcher in a um, prunus tree singing and calling. So willow flycatchers calls are fitzbew, fitzbew, and it's a burrier, uh, buzzier fitzbew call. And um, maybe I have just showed you why um, these birds are so confusing because of my notes not showing, I may have moved on to Willow. And so that previous page, <laughs> let's, let's see if I just screwed up on that. Uh, but these again, look at the primary projection, the wing bars and the thin eye ring. Again, bicolored lower mandible, whitish throat. But this bird I know for a fact is, yeah, and this is the alder. So uh, I did screw up. That just is a great example of of uh, how difficult these birds are. Um, so I'm gonna try to go back again. Yep. So this is, I apologize, this is willow flycatcher. Um, and I wanna show you this again because these birds are really tricky, obviously. And I've been practicing this for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> so um, when I put that up there on the screen and said 95% of the pinnecks uh, can't be identified in the hand, these are guys that have them in the hand or measuring them, hearing the chips, and they can't tell what they are for sure. But that is willow flycatcher, and I know this one because of this overall very pale gray, so that's what jogged me when I saw that. Um, and this bird below is, again, the grayer ones. But this thing on the left is... Wow, I mean, it's right there. You look at these primary projections again and the uh, moderate wing bars with a good amount of white, slender eye ring, the crown, bicolored bill, and the yellowish underneath. So these are the keys toward uh, these birds. Again, the call is your best friend. Okay, alder flycatcher. So these guys have a little bit bolder, I think, in the wing bars. And I was gonna point that out when I got to this one. 
The eye ring is still very basically thin and small. The bill is mostly bicolored on all these individuals. The primer projection is a little bit shorter on these individuals, I think. And I think you're gonna see that on this bird here as well. The bill is a little smaller, heads a little bigger and rounder, maybe not quite as, as pointed. A little rounder, a little more bicolored, a little about the same in bicolored maybe. Oh, oops, 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 going too fast. And again, fairly good markings on the wing bars. Primary projection is a moderate tail length, a medium tail length, not necessarily too huge. Uh, but uh, Alder Flycatcher is the Phoebeo, as I said, and the, the calls I absolutely know, the, the, <laughs> the Willow is Fitzbew, the Alder is Phoebeo. And uh, those are going to be your best friends in identifying these birds. Uh, in fact, I was with Andrew Young in Gaddy Garden, and we had a bird that came in below us and was feeding about, um, I'd say, 25 to 35 feet away and came in for two moments, had a fairly small bill, did not ever call, um, never saw the bird again after at least the bird that I knew it was. Suddenly, here's an Acadian fly catcher that comes in, comes in close, comes in all around us, flies back into that same general area that this bird had been feeding in. And I just kind of went, okay, I thought it was an alder, but maybe I'm wrong because it didn't call again. So your humility factor is an important cause when you get into, uh, to be taken care of when you get into Impidnex fly catchers. They will humble you rapidly. So this is Alder Flycatcher. Uh, this bird has a very nice fresh eye ring, looks like fresh plumage, uh, very good uh, tail length, um, but not too long, not more than moderate pr uh, primary projection again. There is no huge gap here, extending that primary out there. And again, this Alder Flycatcher at the top of the little marshy area, looking fairly round headed, but very average. So it's in the middle, uh, of the birds and um, it is not uh, the hugest, it is not the hugest build, it is not the longest tail, it has not got the longest primary projection. Now we're gonna look at a different bird that is theoretically one of the easiest to identify. And this is the obviously yellow-bellied flycatcher. Um, yellow-bellied flycatcher has almost always a completely yellow under, um, lower mandible. And uh, the, the upper mandible sometimes can again show toward the tip and on the edge of the gape, a little bit of the yellowish on the upper mandible as well. Mostly fairly, um, fairly prominent wing bars. Sometimes as you can see on this individual in particular, they're uh, quite greenish yellowish at times. The yellowish wash goes from the head all the way down through the eye ring, all the way down through the throat, all the way down to the undertail coverts. And um, yet I want you to look at the primary projection, particularly in this bird. This is a fairly long primary projection for a small bird like this, giving it a rather short-tailed look in some respects. Um, but um, look at how this overall bird has such an incredibly prominent eye ring. The eye ring really stands out in every one of these shots. Let's look at the next page and you'll see the same thing. Uh, every one of these birds has a small bill though. So when you, if you think about what happened when we were talking about Acadian flycatcher and we were looking at some of those shots and you had an overall kind of greenish bird, greenish yellow bird, and you had that lower mandible that was bright yellow, but look at how tiny this bill is on this individual on this bird as well. All three of these show very, very fine bills. And I think this long primary projection combined with this very, very short-tailed appearance on a very small, a smallish bird is a really diagnostic combination that gives you the ability to identify almost all yellow-billed flycatchers without the calls. Now these will do a chibunk call, so it's very similar to uh, in a lot of respects to the least flycatcher. So I think you really need to pay attention to um, the call of the least flycatcher, get that down 
and then learn the yellow-bellied flycatcher. They are calling in migration and they call regularly in migration the whole time they pass through Missouri. A lot of birds don't call in Texas. So when if you bird Texas and the Gulf Coast and High Island and places like that, they do not sing when they first hit land normally. There is very little calling. You do not hear the massive numbers of Tennessees or black poles or bay breasts. And the same is true with a lot of the flycatchers. They don't seem to call with any real regularity down there. Once they get up here to basically Missouri, somewhere in Missouri, they seem to trigger something, whether it's photoperiodism or they're getting close to the breeding grounds. I don't know for sure. I don't think anybody knows. But what happens is that they do start singing. And this includes yellow-bellied flycatcher as well. So here's the yellow-bellied first page again. This is one of, one of these classic, just bright yellow birds that is just, you know, dead obvious what it is. Again, fairly short bill on each one of these birds, not as long a honker as the Acadian. If anybody has the longer bill, it would be this one. And then you have all these birds are giving very nice short bills with very prominent eye rings very prominent yellowish wing bars and still have this overall yellowish green color. So that's kind of our closing of the Missouri species. And now we move into, as you can see, quiz time. So this is a species that is has this big reddish in the wings, and yet it's a little different than what we looked at in the other myarchus that I emphasized. So anybody want to put in a chat or question and answer thing for Paige, please do so. You have a few seconds and I will shift to the next one. This is a bird that we need to be looking for actively in Missouri. It would be a first state record. Okay, here's two slides you've seen before and you have seen both of these birds. And do you remember or can you now identify these birds? These were at the beginning you looked at these slides when we went through. I only screwed up on one of them, <coughs> right? And so you're going to see that uh, this bird on the left is different than this bird on the right. And so please um, send in your votes now on those two. Okay, I'm going to shift the page. Oops, I identified these for you. There on the left is another first state record, the Pacific Slope flycatcher in the hand. This is characterized by the yellowish coloration of the um, our yellow-bellied flycatcher, but a little bit more brownish in tone, has a little bit more ochreous in the wing bars, and yet it has this big teardrop at the end of the eye ring. And it has a pretty big bill, doesn't it? Here's willow flycatcher. And willow flycatcher, again, is this grayer, blander uh, impidnax with a very narrow eye ring. Uh, both of them are crested. These are two Western birds from um, um, Point Reyes Bird Observatory. Okay, are we ready for the next one? There are the answers to the first set. So this was the Acadian, this was the least, and this is the yellow-bellied. Um, and Obviously, I think from this slide in particular, you can really see the smallness of the bill, the bolder eye ring on yellow bellied, and then how that compares to this big bill of Acadian. Um, the wing bars are very different on this. This is a, probably a fall immature bird showing some uh, fringes that are not worn off yet. You can see these little fringes here, and that, those will probably wear off as the bird migrates through. Least flycatcher in the middle has, again, the smaller bill, but overall a grayish and a medium eye ring. Okay, so we have the eastern wood peewee on the left, we have the scissor tail flycatcher, and we have a cotton mouth at Mingo that I took about five days ago. Um, so as you're looking up in our birding, we need to also keep our eyes down. Every once in a while, keep be aware of where we are. Okay, so I'm gonna, one time, one more thing. This is my thank you screen. And um, on the left, yellow-bellied, on the right, Acadian. The big bill of Acadian, again, is very, very distinctive when put side by side with the yellow-bellied. The coloration can be very similar. 
except for again, the yellow, as we talked about, goes all the way up into the head. It may pale in the belly in the middle of it and on the under tail coverts a little bit, but look at the tail length different. We talked about the tail length differences and how, how long the Acadian flycatcher tail was and how short appearing the yellow bellied was. But if you really look at that, that tail cuts off right there and it's still shorter than the rectrices of the Acadian. The Acadian is a larger flycatcher. It's about the same size of head, but the bill size is really helpful. And so that's something that you can look at as you're looking at these greenish gray uh, guys, you'll hopefully be able to um, ha have some assistance in uh, the bill size and the, and the shape of the eye rings and stuff and the coloration. So thank you very much. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, what, so the first bird that you showed when you're like, guess which one this is, we had guests of great crested flycatcher and ash throated flycatcher. Do you want to reveal the answer to that bird? I absolutely will be happy to. <laughs> I'm going to quit keynote here and try to get out of that program. Um, okay, that's not happening. So let me go back here to Zoom so I can see you and what's going on. There we go. Um, the first bird was an ashlord flycatcher. That's correct. So the pale gray head, the paler, uh, almost whitish um, ventral surface was the key to that bird. And the, the uh, rusty colored margins of the primaries, which is superficially very much like the um, gray crested, um, is actually really distinctive because that reddish really shows up. The tail also has a lot more um, of a different, uh, I'd say more of a lighter brick colored as opposed to an orangey colored uh, rust color in it. So um, next, next one, Paige. Yeah, lots of thank yous coming in in the chat, Tim. I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, and then Edge, do you want to, can you see some of the Q&A questions? Do you want to start going through those? Oh, you're on mute, Edge, sorry. <laughs> I think I muted you earlier just in case. So that was my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been muted a few times in my life too, don't worry. Okay, there we go. We're there good. we go. <laughs> All right, um, the first one, and uh, uh, there are two questions talking about uh, primary projection. All right. And uh, I'm going to put them put them together. Uh, one, the first one says some authors talk about a quote wing formula, which makes it sound like math is involved. Any idea where that terminology comes from? And then the second question that I think is probably related is. Can you clarify, when you say primary projection, are you talking about how far the primaries project down from the secondaries or, are, or how far they project down the tail or how far they project from each primary? Thanks. Right, okay, those are very valid questions and um, I'm going to make a little sketch here and we're going to talk about the shape of the wing. And so the wing formula, first of all, is the measurement of every individual primary and secondary on a wing. And when you've got a bird in the hand and you're banding a bird, you actually take out the calipers and you actually measure and you compare the length of every single individual primary. And you can, so you can measure primary 10, primary nine, primary seven, primary eight. You can get exact measurements on some of these tricky birds. And so there is a four, it's called the wing formula when you have an exact ratio of what each one of those lengths are in a, in a so if this were 10, nine, eight, seven, and six, you'd have a ratio of length on every one of the, the lengths of these overall from the, the entire primary length, from the bend of the wing. So the bend of the wing is up here. And then this is where the secondaries end. So these are the wing bars on the tertials. 
and the covert uh, edges up here. And then you go into the markings on the secondaries and then you go into the primaries. And so can you see those? Are those showing up okay? That's too, it's, it's, it's too right. bright. Uh, there's no contrast. There? That's great, there? right there yeah. is good. Okay, so yeah. the bend of the wing, the wing bars, the markings on the secondaries, and then each of the primaries. These are kind of an open set of primaries. You saw that in some of the birds. And each one of these primaries, this might be number 10, number nine, number seven, number uh, eight, eight, seven, six, right on down. And each bird, I don't care if it's a sparrow or a, a, a red-tailed hawk or a willow flycatcher, there is a specific ratio of those wing measurements that is used for a banner to critically and positively identify each one of these birds. And there may be a bill length, there may be a confirmation of a tail length and a primary uh, overall, but you're gonna have all these individuals have a specific ratio. We as birders don't have that. We cannot have that bird in our hand. So what we're doing with primary projection is estimating, we're estimating the distance from here to here. And that distance is this primary projection. So let me make another wing right here next to it. And we're gonna show you the difference between um, the primary projection of those little guys. And um, I'm gonna make a third one in the middle. that will be the shortest ones. But you get the idea, I hope, of these, what these are. So this one would be over here. This would be a fairly long, but also I'm showing this broadly. And then you might have this one that is again, the primaries extending beyond the secondaries. I didn't mark in the secondaries there. Let's mark them in quickly. Oh, what an artist, John James Audubon. I'm telling you. Okay, so here you go with the secondaries and then everything beyond the secondaries is the primaries. And so secondaries, primaries, secondaries, primaries. This would be a short, very short primary projection, right? This would be long and a massive primary projective. And then this would be, if I cut that off a little bit shorter, say make it up here, where I'm making my dark bar now, they were only like that, then it'd be moderate, right? You have a shorter projection beyond here. These are only guesstimates because we cannot measure them exactly. I hope that helps. Uh, question, you use the word primary projection and primary extension, but same thing? Yep. Okay. Just wanted Sorry. to clear loop, that. Loose um, loop thinks ships. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Mitch. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting one, and, and um, this has two pieces to it. I'm going to start with, uh, so it's better to photo, to photograph the bird, to specifically identify it. No. Mostly, no, no, wait a minute. Mostly okay. I don't stay in place long enough or close enough to specifically ID. So, so this goes back to my opening comment about learning the, uh, and inviting you to go to All About Birds or uh, Zanto, uh, Zeno Canto or any one of these uh, websites that have extensive sound databases. Um, uh, and again, the, the reason that I think um, the, uh, individual early, early on uh, de-emphasized the sound was that they didn't know what the songs were. Um, and ornithologists will often look at a dead bird in the hand. Um, more recent ornithologists look at, uh, they may still be collecting, but they're also studying behavior, recording behavior uh, prior to that. So they're learning more about the full, the full gamut of what these species are doing. And I think that the sound is critical for particularly um, anybody who's trying to really identify with any speed whatsoever. Uh, and again, because so many birds, when they come back, what do they do? They immediately move into a nesting phase. I mean, they, they get back, they set up a territory, they grab a, the best possible territory they can get, and then they immediately start nesting. Some of the hummingbirds are nesting within a few days after getting back. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if you were out at uh, you know, up in northern Missouri, where there's some extensive willow flycatcher habitat, those birds come in and they're 
a female there a couple days later and she's building a nest and is on territory and, and nesting. And then very quickly what happens, they go silent because they're protecting the female. They're protecting their ability to, um, to uh, avoid predation. So they're trying to lose any ability to attract anything, us or anything else. And most birds do this, whether it's a, you, you'll see a wood thrush come in. If he has a mate immediately, they'll uh, call at a certain time of day, but then there's a lot of periods of time where birds will be completely silent. This is one of the reasons why white breasted and nuthatches are missed on big days, because in early May, they've already been setting up their territories, they're already setting up their stuff, and they go completely silent for a couple of weeks in May. And that's why well, that's one of the, the birds that often gets missed. So it's the same thing with all these species, and it's across the board. I hope that helps. In conjunction with that, the question about getting a photograph. Right. Um, the questioner asked, mentioned that uh, he uses Merlin in conjunction to verify what he's hearing. And we've had quite a discussion on of Merlin recently on the listserv. And um, it came down to, for most of us, use it with caution, use your brain, because Merlin is not perfect and Merlin knows it's not perfect. And it will sometimes with a pair of birds, for example, a red-eyed vireo, a um, Philadelphia vireo, and I've had some other pairings that are interesting, um, chipping sparrow and worm-eating warbler right. and pine warbler and uh, dark-eyed junco right all of those have come up on merlin when it's looking when it's hearing one bird that i'm looking at so we're talking about using merlin as a verifier it uh, it can be a verifier but sometimes it's to suggest to you your options and i'll take it with from We'll give it to you to follow up on that on use of Merlin. Uh, okay, so I don't use Merlin and I have no familiarity with it whatsoever, but I've been following this discussion carefully. I've seen some people using it in the field now, um, including uh, some of the people who are very uh, actively using it. And um, I've read some of their commentary and here are my thoughts. Um, I'm old school enough that um, I was still in the first wave when the uh, birders were really going, hey, we need to learn all the bird calls. Um, and that was, you know, 50 some years ago now. Um, but back in the day when I was growing up, um, guys like Earl Comfort and the Earl Has and the Warren Lamerts and the people in the St. Louis area who were outstanding birders uh, didn't have the grounding and even bird song uh, that we have today, let alone chips and let alone flight calls at night and let alone all this other stuff. So um, my sense of memorization and as you know, Edge from having taught birding classes, I recommend highly birding by ear, uh, which was a, um, a tape based system or CD based system where you drill yourself and you go through and you learn it the old fashioned way. And I think, you know, I'm pretty old school when it comes to Peterson field guides. Uh, I still would recommend to any beginning bird, the, the 1950 edition, uh, 49 edition of Peterson Field Guides, 1953 revision. Um, that is a very simple bird book uh, with very simple text immediately opposite. It has the uh, classic uh, pointers with it. The front and back rear end pages have silhouettes um, giving you the very basic shape. Now today we can take hundreds of birds and we can look at hundreds of shapes and we can listen to hundreds of birds songs and chips and flight calls and so there are many more aids than we ever had before i am not opposed to any of those uh, and so probably when the intelligence uh, of uh, a program like um, merlin gets to the point where it can identify things with higher accuracy 
you're going to have something very useful. But what the hell? What are you doing it for? Because if you're not going out to learn something and to enjoy having learned something, then I don't know what you're doing in the field. Because you can just send a drone out if you want to do that. And you know, from what I've seen other people doing at times, where you take a you go to a place, you take a photograph of all the shorebirds there, you blow it up and you identify things, and you go home and identify it on the computer, what's the point? The point is to me, and the reason I taught beginning birding is because people are curious and we're human beings and we want to get involved with nature. We want to get involved. Uh, in understanding, we want to find ways to enjoy and appreciate and relax things from what we're doing normally. And so to me, my personal belief system would lead me toward uh, a comprehensive uh, move away from something like an a automatic identification system. I want a follow up with some of that. The question is, and I'll put it in its basic, the form that it's written here. Right. Is it ethical to play a recorded song in an effort to get an answer? I think in some situations that absolutely is, but you have to be aware that if you are in territory um, and if you are in a nesting territory, you are pushing those birds immediately the reaction that you're getting in a nesting territory is a territorial response. And the bird is gonna come and defend its territory. So you're creating immediate stress. Sure, it's nothing more than what a cardinal uh, who you know, comes into a bird feeder that happens to be in, you know, but you're gonna see a re stress reaction. You're gonna see an agitated, aggressive reaction. And you're influencing that bird's behavior or you're influencing what that nesting pair has to go through. So you know, I'm not, I'm not God. I don't play God. Um, but, you know, my, my concept is, is that as long as you're aware of what you're doing, and as long as you're playing it once or twice only, and being very careful in volume. So I would say lower volumes and, um, and uh, ver being sensitive to the fact that you're in a nesting territory uh, use your own discretion, but be be aware that if you're observed by other birders who are going to be critical of that, um, you know, can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. You're talking about in nesting territories. What about in migration when we know it's not a species that's going to be nesting in Missouri, it's coming through? What about that? I'd say that's a much more uh, open situation, wouldn't it be? I mean, you're not influencing the birds. Um, you're certainly still affecting them, but uh, you may be actually doing some beneficial things um, because they're looking for flocking behavior. They're looking for um, things, that, but you're also fooling. You're also playing the trickster in that situation where you're, um, you're saying to them, hey, I'm over here, come migrate with me maybe. Um, but you know, it's a different, it's a different situation. Um, and I'd say it's clearly a better uh, opportunity to play a call to try to get a response. One final question. What is your favorite bird? Uh, the hardest one. <laughs> impossible. I can't answer that. I have, I've seen, you know, close to 4,500 species because all my work in North and South America now and Europe and, you know, New Zealand and parts of Asia. And um, I, I tend to think that, you know, the wimbrel is one of my very most meaningful, the wimbrel and the upland sandpiper, but they mean something because when, the, the bobwhite quail too, because those, those guys were my very first birds. And when I went up to Massachusetts as an eight year old, and my mother took me to the um, Chilmark Nature Center, and I went out on the field trip with Edward L. Shalif, who wrote the Mexican Field Guide with Roger Torrey Peterson, uh, who illustrated it. Um, I had the opportunity to be manipulated by an expert birder, and he um, took me to Katama with an, all the other people too, but he was paying attention to me. He was going like, look at Timmy, look at those birds over there, you know, and I'm going like, wow, what are those? Why does that one bird have a straight bill? Why does that one bird have a curved bill? Look, they're 
it looks like they're eating the same things. Why are they doing that? And, and you know, at, at eight years old, you know, that made a huge impression on me. Um, so I think shorebirds, because of that, have always been my favorite family. Um, I adore, you know, I, went, I was the first person to ever go to Chair del Fuego to film winter plumage of Hudsonian godwits, um, you know, just because. And I got red knots and white rump sandpipers and bears and all kinds of cool stuff that go all the way down to Tierra del Fuego because of that. And I've been, you know, all over the high Arctic islands, you know, and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, or I found the first orange breasted falcon nest in Venezuela. How do you differentiate the love that you feel between a black burning warbler that I was running across the Tower Grove Park. Dave Henney's going, I've got a bay of black burning right here, you know. You know, it's cardinals, white throated sparrows, dark eyed juncos, the first ones you see in the fall. I don't I can't answer that. There's no answer. Thank you for asking though. Appreciate it very much. Okay, Paige. <laughs> All right. And with that awesome answer. <laughs> Um, I often get made fun of for saying every bird is my favorite bird as well. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yep. It's hard to choose, but thank you so much, Tim, for thank speaking you. with us to my, tonight. It was awesome information. Um, thank you for taking on the challenge of teaching us a very notoriously tricky group of birds. And you saw it live. I mean, how <laughs> tricky they are. I even yes. had my pages all set up, but because my notes didn't show, I screwed up. And that is really a very important lesson there, how close these guys are. Yes. So yes. thank you all. for Thank you so much. You're very and, welcome. Yeah. And thank you, Edge, for co-hosting with me Amen. as well. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and this webinar is recorded and you'll be able to find it on the Missouri Birding Society website, as well as the Missouri River Bird Observatory YouTube channel. So we'll, One yes, second. Edge. Uh, there will be a delay for it coming up on the MBS website. So it may be 10 days, uh, but it will be there permanently once it is on there. Thank you for clarifying cool. that, Edge. Yes, please give us some patience as we work all that out. Um, but thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night and a very birdie tomorrow morning. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night, Good night. everybody. <laughs>